<laughs> we have someone coming in. Oh, hi. It hi. is Hello. he. It is Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm late. I, I was going to sit out in the in the garden, and the, the neighbour has started working with a power saw or something like that. So that's impossible. Okay. Hang on a second. Let me get no problem. Let uh, sort it out here. John, uh, nice to see you again today. And this is uh, my friends here, Inês from Porto Portugal. Yeah. She will help Hi. us. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hello. Have we yeah. have we have we met before, Inês? No, I, never. Okay. And by I, her I, side, I've, 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 I've corresponded with a, a, a Portuguese talking oh, um, transla remember? English translator, so I wondered if... It... No, it's not me, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> I wish. All right. Um, am, I, am I in frame here? I look like my chin's a bit yeah. low, is that right? You're yeah. okay? Yes, That's okay. That's better. That better. Sergio, how about you begin? Yes, let's begin. I, I think you know Ronald. Uh, he got in touch with you, and later on we will you tell what what relation you there is between you two. Okay, it's a special oh, there, announcement today. There isn't a relation yet, but there <laughs> will be on the shelves. <laughs> Fortunately, we, our two names will be on the cover page of uh, of a book uh, because you know I'm in the middle of translating this. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Nice. So, but 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 I know um, Ronald, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's me. Yeah. Um, all, all the way back to um, a a publication called Quetar. Um, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's where I, I first came across your name, and you invented the Quenya typewriter, the Tengua typewriter. <laughs> yeah. That's Have I got that right. right? That's right. Left, left. Yes, exactly, John. <laughs> yeah, I, I was Thank very you. impressed. Thank you uh, for bringing Ronald, that up. Ronald is a long time Token Society member for something like 40 years. He has a long career as a tokenist and more than 20 years translating token books and related material. <laughs> I can tell by uh, the beard. It shows exactly <laughs> the beard. <laughs> I didn't have the beard before the, the pandemic, you know, but... <laughs> right. Pandemic right. effect. So, John, uh, we are so happy to have you here with us at Talk and Talk. You're welcome at our channel. And this is uh, the first of, I hope, a long series of Talk and Talk interviews. And today we have the honor to talk to you. And those who are at home in Brazil will be able to follow this complete interview through the subtitles embedded here in the video. Although our channel is mainly made in Portuguese, today we have an international guest, as I said. So this special interview will interest the whole tokenist world. And now uh, Inez and Ronald will give our audience a brief professional background about uh, John Garth. Please, so, Inez. Let's begin. Uh, I will talk about John Garth a little bit. So uh, John Garth is the British author of the acclaimed biographical book, this one, Tolkien and the Great War, a uh, winner of the Mytho Peak Award for Scholarship 2004. Uh, Garth was fellow in Humanistic Studies for 2015-16 at the Black Mountain Institute, University of Las Vegas, Nevada. After Tolkien and the Great War, he published the booklet Tolkien at Exeter College, uh, our Oxford undergr undergraduate created Middle Earth in 2014, which was nominated for the Mytho Peak Award for Scholarship 2015. John Garth speaks regularly on Tolkien and related topics, having taught uh, courses on Tolkien on Oxford University and for the Mythgard Institute at the C University. Uh, with more than two and a half decades in journalism, John has interviewed many major figures and written articles for important media portals, such as the Daily Beast, the Times, the Observer, and the Guardian. Garth's most recent book, The Worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, takes the reader to the real places that inspired Tolkien to create fictional locations in Middle-earth. 
John Garth draws on his profound knowledge of Tolkien's life and work to shed light on the processes of invention behind Tolkien's work of fantasy. He also debunks popular misconceptions about the inspirations for Middle Earth and puts forward strong new claims of his own. John Garth studied English language and literature at St. Anne's College in Oxford, and now he combines freelance writing and editing with his other activities as a public speaker and as a teacher. And taking advantage of John's presence here, uh, we will make a special announcement at the end of the interview. Okay, so Ser um, to celebrate this, this interview, I just have one sentence to say to John. That is Ellen Silla Lumen no Mentielo. Uh, my star shines upon our meeting. Okay? My government. My government. So let's begin. Uh, the first quest question, uh, I believe you receive it a lot, but it's, it's important. Uh, what was the first token book you read and when? It was The Lord of the Rings. Um, and when it was sometime in March, I think, 1975, um, when I was nine. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So I was very young. Uh, the book was on the family bookshelves, and I had already looked at it. It was huge. It was the biggest book on our shelves. <laughs> and everything about it was strange. Um, it, it had a, it was a single volume with a, a yellow spine with the red word Tolkien across the back, and I would open it and look at the maps and the chapter titles and the inscriptions, so the the doors of Durin and so on, um, and and I just knew that this was a world that I wanted to travel in, because I had already read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia which also had maps, you know, um, and, and a number of other books that were fantasy fiction with, with maps. And this just, it was, a, it was a guarantee to me that this would work. Um, uh, plus the, the, the quality of the names, there was something about them that appealed to me beautifully. And, and I, I very much identify with what Tolkien said about seeing the names of Welsh towns on coal trucks behind his house when he was a, a child. Um, so I did the same thing when I saw place names such as Lothlorien, right? Um, so that was it. I, one evening I just had some time to spare and uh, I was waiting to watch something on television, a film, uh, The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, and I, I, I loved uh, scary films in those days. Um, and so I picked the book up at last, uh, having previously thought, I'm not going to read this till I'm much older because it's such a big book. Um, but there it was, and I started and never, never looked back. How funny nice. that you remember all the cruel details, all the, details. the <laughs> film you were going to watch on TV. <laughs> it was, a, you know, a major turning point in my life. And I... I think I was aware of that quite soon because I, I, I read it, I loved it. I, of course, I did not understand all of it, but I then yeah, right. reread it and reread it. You know how it goes. Nice. Okay, so let's go to the first question. That is uh, second. from, se yeah, second, sorry. Uh, from being a mere Tolkien fan, uh, how did you become a Tolkienist? What was uh, the trigger, so to speak? Um, the trigger was two, two separate things. One was my long-standing fascination with the invented languages. So, so from that beginning, being fascinated by the names, I then very quickly moved to working out that these names were meaningful and making my own little lists of what elvish words, for common elvish words like door for land and ered for mountains, what they meant, and then gradually that became more and more comprehensive, more and more complete and complex. Um, and I was still doing this, so that started probably about 1976. I was still doing this in 1996 when the final volume of The History of Middle-earth was published. And at that point, um, 
I decided it was time to, to make the ultimate Elvish dictionary. Um, but this is a very complex task, not just because Elvish is complex, but because Tolkien kept changing Elvish. Um, yeah. so, I, so I felt that the only way to make this lexicon was to make it like a piece of archaeology mm. with strata for different periods of Tolkien's work. And that, that meant that before I could even start uh, building the lexicon, I had to build a list of texts that Tolkien wrote and try to arrange them in date order. Now, <laughs> that is, is where the fascination with Tolkien's creative processes really came from. Um, so the final step in this was that I was looking at um, the Book of Lost Tales and some of the footnotes to the Book of Lost Tales, which said this poem was written in this army training camp in 1916 or this army training camp in 1917. And I decided that it would be very valuable to understand what Tolkien did in the First World War. Um, and, and meanwhile, at the same time, I was reading uh, fiction about the First World War, some very, very good uh, in English novels about the First World War, uh, one called Birdsong by Sebastian Falks and one called Regeneration by Pat Barker. Um, and I was, I was really struck by the realisation that everything we understand about the First World War is about disenchantment, about the idea that magic and illusions are all swept away by the violence, the reality, a big, a big awakening of, of human uh, awareness of what, how bitter existence really is, you know. And that Tolkien, instead of coming out of the First World War and writing that kind of stuff, um, came out and wrote a, a massive fairy tale, a mythology. Uh, and I thought that that was a, a fascinating thing and I wanted to understand why. That's why I started writing Tolkien and the Great War. Yeah. Wonderful. I, um, I can uh, mention a, an interesting book about the First World War. It's fiction and it's called uh, No Man's Land, written by one Simon Tolkien. Oh yes, that's right. So I, I was, I was a historical consultant on that book because I, I know, I know Simon because I wrote Tolkien in the Great War. Uh, I think it's my turn to pose a question, uh, John. How important is it to understand Tolkien's life in order to understand Tolkien's legendarium? You have given some hints already. Yeah. Well, there are two ways of reading a book. One is to read a book in terms of what it means to you personally, and that's very important, of course. Um, but another way is to, to read a book and to try to understand what was intended by it and how it would have been understood at the time that it was conceived. Um, and I think to do that, you need, to, of course, to understand the author's life and, and everything that was going on in it that mattered to that author. Um, so there are people, of course, who feel that they're quite happy to read, say, The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings without understanding anything about Tolkien's life and times. And they can take those books wherever they want them to. Right. Um, they can use those books to satisfy their own sense of what the world is about and what matters. Um, but. Yes, if you, if you want to grasp um, whether Tolkien meant this or that, then you've got to understand where he was coming from, as we say in England, um, what, what his, how his ideas would have formed against the background of his, not only his times, but his reading, his scholarship, and so on. And it's much, it's very common for people to study Tolkien's scholarship, his, his expertise in Old English literature or Norse literature, and to interpret what he wrote in the light of those things. It's less common 
to write to look at his life and his times um, and to interpret his work in those contexts and the reason it's less common is because Tolkien didn't like it right um, Tolkien did not like biographical criticism um, and he said so more and more plainly and loudly as he got older I, I think there are very good reasons and understandable reasons why he did that. Um, his, I think it, it was a, it was a bedrock of his belief that um, the work of art was the important thing. In, uh, and he also felt later on when he became subjected to interviews, the the people interviewing him, the people reading about him, simply did not understand him at all what he was about it was all too complex for them <laughs> now i think so much has been published that we have a, a wealth of material with which to understand him and also simply with the passing of time it's possible to look back at his era his lifetime and see it more clearly than i believe he himself could this is a common thing. I think I think people in 40 years time, 50 years time will look back at our extremely confusing era and be able to make much more sense of it than we can. Nice. Wonderful. So next question. Um, why is there so little detailed material among Tolkien's letters dealing with his memories of the First World War? Uh, mostly, I think, because um, there's a body of letters written during the First World War to his wife, Edith, or his fiancée, Edith. They married in 1916, so in the middle of the war. Mm. And they, because they were very personal, they have not been published. Uh, secondly, Although Tolkien wrote letters to his very close friends, uh, Christopher Wiseman, Geoffrey Bates Smith, Robert Quilter Gilson of the TCBS, the Tea Club and Barovian mm -hmm. Society, the letters that he wrote to them have not survived. Um, and that's just the okay. chances of time. You know, two of them died. Their families either didn't keep any, anything or threw away some of the material not knowing of course was going to be famous um tolkien kept his friends letters so that's why we can read their stuff and and he, he there, there are a couple of very important letters that were sent back to him by his friends um which he also kept so mm -hmm. yeah yeah about uh, uh, and, and, uh, i'm sorry okay and the, the final point um is that like m many First World War veterans, Tolkien did not like talking about his experiences to mm -hmm. people who did not share them. So, so old soldiers tended to only open up about the terrible times or the fun times that they had with each other because they felt that other people would not understand them. Yes, uh, I, I believe Tolkien, during some periods of his life, he used to write a diary. Do you think that someday we'll have this material published? I know. I think it's 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 fairly clear that um, as his literary executor, Christopher Tolkien uh, saw no reason to publish that yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether he envisaged it being published in the in the future sometime. Um, and I don't know if those papers have ever been deposited among the family papers at the Bodleian Library. Um, so, so the answer to that is I have no idea, but of course, I think it would be extraordinarily valuable if, if yes. they do become available. Um, it, would, it would hugely enrich our understanding of Tolkien. It would allow us to clear up many questions and speculations and of course it would probably fuel many more speculations because of the sheer richness of the of the soil there uh, i want to say something about um the 
something you said uh, two questions ago, maybe, uh, that we know that the, one of the triggers for Tolkien uh, begin to, to, uh, uh, to write his legendarium was the First World, World War, we know that. Uh, but uh, maybe three years ago, when I was at the uh, university, I studied at the uh, Faculty of Letters of the University of Lisbon. I had a course called uh, English Literature uh, from the past century. And uh, in some classes, we studied the uh, authors uh, that were, uh, how do I say, <laughs> uh, that uh, were influenced by the First World War. They fought mm -hmm. on the First World War, and they and then they wrote about it. M yes. the, most of the works were poems, and they were brutal, terrible. Uh, and we, when I think about it, we never studied Tolkien, and I think no one stud studies Tolkien to study the First World War. And that's curious because it was one of the major triggers for him to begin to to write about his legendary. Indeed. Yeah. So, is that a question? <laughs> no, no, it's just, it was just a comment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but now okay. it's to, to ask you something. So, uh, so, so can, I, can I comment briefly? Yeah, yeah. Um, yep, so, please, so, what happens, do. of course, is, is that people are very varied and their, their experiences are very varied, the way they respond to and write about their experiences. But when it comes to constructing in English literature courses, the English literary canon, as it's called, um, selections are made. Yeah. And they acquire a certain unified flavour because academicians like to uh, show a certain line of development through liter literary history. And so a, a great deal is excluded. Um, so, so there, there were people writing very conventional, old-fashioned poetry that we don't read anymore. There were people writing. There were a few people writing fairy stories. There's nothing as extraordinary as Tolkien's, um, but none of that fits into what teachers expect to teach about the First World War. Uh, I had to to buy a book to that classes, but I didn't because it was too expensive and it was a book about uh, 100 pages, uh, 1000 pages maybe. Uh, it was like an English uh, literature canon and there was not a single page about Tolkien, not uh, a small poem, a short story, nothing. No, no, yeah. no. He, he got deselected. <laughs> yeah. But you know, th there's something quite beautiful about being an outsider. You yeah, know, yeah. sure, the, sure. <laughs> that you have no one pinning you down and um, at the moment with Tolkien there's quite a, a range of different voices um, that, that are influencing the way people understand him and that's great. Yeah, it doesn't need to, to fit in some book to be understand on some, some, some canon. Kind of... Wonderful. Right. Yeah, okay. And so also, no, also if, pe if, if people are not told to read something, they will enjoy yeah. it more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So now it's my turn again. Um, so, in order to write Tolkien and the Great War, you must have had access to a uh, giant amount of material, both about the war and Tolkien as an army officer. Uh, regarding the later, uh, what kind of material and sources did you use? Um, Tolkien as an army officer, well, the first thing that I saw was his personal service record as an officer. Um, and I was hoping that this would give a, a wealth of information. Actually, it was very limited. It was mostly about how ill he was from the end of his experience in the Battle of the Somme in 1916, when he, he, he fell sick with something called trench fever, um, which made him so ill, he had to be sent back to England and never actually returned to the trenches, um, thank, thankfully. Yeah, that's um, it. <laughs> so, so this was, it, it wasn't terribly helpful for understanding his creativity, um, or I didn't think so at the time. Now, I do think it was it was helpful because now I realise that um, uh, some of the way we understand when Tolkien wrote 
the original Silmarillion, the Book of Lost Tales, uh, is mistaken. Uh, I can talk about that shortly if you like. Um, but anyway, back to your question. After that, I looked at um, the the war diaries of Tolkien's battalion. So the battalion is the small unit of maybe 700 men that moved around and fought together. And they had to keep a day by day account of what they did. Um, that mentioned Tolkien once. I looked at um, other publica uh, publications by his regiment. Now, reg the regiment is the bigger organization to which the battalion belongs. Um, and there was a tiny bit about Tolkien in there, but almost nothing. Um, most of this material was really just building a picture of what the experience must have been like for Tolkien, though he did not record his impressions of it personally. I looked at a great deal of published and unpublished material to help build that picture. Um, and then I also had permission eventually from the Tolkien estate to go to the Bodleian Library in Oxford and look at a certain small set of his own papers. And those included the, le the letters that I mentioned earlier between him and the TCBS. And those were fantastic. They, they gave, I think, the beating heart to my book. You know, it was no longer just about um, a, a man who did not record his own experiences, but I had to try to reconstruct them. I now saw him in dialogue with his friends. You know, they are responding to things he said, so I can tell what he said a lot of the time. Um, and, and they in themselves are rich characters. Um, I've, I've, I love them dearly after I got to know them, you know. Um, and then there, there were a few papers also, uh, such as trench maps, and, um, and what has been referred to as a diary of, of his time in the trenches, but it's actually just a single sheet of paper with a list of dates and places. I, I, in 2018, I went to Oxford to the Maker of Middle-earth exhibition. I right. remember seeing a document that uh, I believe it was an identification document. And it said that Tolkien had a cauliflower ear, something like that. <laughs> Very so, interesting. Uh, that's an, that's an example of one of the things that I did not see when I was <laughs> researching my book. And I think the reason for that, not that the estate was deliberately holding anything back. It was that the archivist, Catherine McIlwain, who, who curated that exhibition that you saw, had not at that time been appointed. So she was actually appointed, she was appointed as a result of my work and also the work done by um, Wayne Hammond and Christina yeah, Skull for their J.R.R. Tolkien companion and guide. Uh, this kind of work made the estate realize that they needed to assess all the material that they possess, uh, set it in order um, so, that it, so that it's a, a proper resource. Right. Uh, John, uh, right uh, at the start of the First World War, in late 1914, we have a date, the 24th of September 1914. And that is considered by you at least, and by us also, as the birth of Middle Earth. Uh, can you tell us something about this date, the 24th of September 14, and the importance of the poem, The Voyage of Erendil, The Evening Star? So uh, up to that point, Tolkien was hardly a writer at all. He wrote a few poems and, and plays, um, which were, as far as we can tell, almost plays. entirely humorous. Um, they were parodies of things that he had read and enjoyed. But something made him change his tack his direction um, in that period 
say the say the the whole year 1914 and it was two things and he he mentions this in his great lecture on fairy stories where he says uh, that he he wasn't very interested in fairy stories as a child he says a real taste for fairy stories was awoken on the threshold of manhood by philology and quickened to full life by war so what he means by that is that his study at Oxford of Old English literature and Norse literature um, made him interested in the, in the roots of the fragmentary remains of the mythologies that, that existed in the, in the written record from those early medieval times. He, philologists wanted to, to reconstruct from all those fragments the lost tales that had preceded them the stories that had been uh, passed down orally by the great old storytellers among the, um, the yeah. Germanic peoples. And Tolkien was enchanted by that idea. And so it, he, he took that idea, he had seen this in name, Eärendil, in an old English poem where it refers to um, the evening star but it refers to it symbolically in a poem about the coming of christ so you, we might imagine that christ is the the rising sun and the morning i should say the morning star venus because it appears in the evening and in the morning um, the morning star heralds the rising of the sun now tolkien took the name erendel which is not a Christian name. It's a name from some ancient Germanic mythology. And he wanted to imagine the lost tale that went with that name. And he, he knew from um, essays that he had read that this evening star figure, Erendel, was also associated with the sea. So he came up with the idea that he was a mariner who sailed off the edge of the world into the sky. And that's essentially what he remained in the Silmarillion. Um, he was the first figure of Tolkien's legendarium. And the legendarium arose partly because Tolkien, as we know, wanted a home for the language that he was inventing at that time. Of course. Uh, but also partly because... Uh, his friend G.B. Smith of the TCBS said to him, so who is Erendil? And Tolkien said, I don't know. I'll have to find out. I have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> As usual. <laughs> Typically. But a, a recent uh, realisation of mine um, through research that I was doing for my new book, The Worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, is that that summer... Um, when Tolkien was on his holiday in Cornwall, on the, on the coast of England, when the First World War broke out, you, it was possible to stand on the clifftop and look out due west over the sea and see the evening star. And I've checked the weather, um, and it was, for, for <laughs> some of the, time, the evenings he was there, it was perfectly visible. And... I've asked myself, would Tolkien actually have bothered to leave his lodgings and walk to the cliff to look over the sea? And the answer, of course, has to be yes, of course. Yes. He's Tolkien, <laughs> right? How would he have missed that Wonderful. opportunity? So he would have seen the evening star. And he builds, I think, that's, that story of standing on the seashore and looking west into the story of Tuor as well, the father of Eärendil. Yeah. Wonderful. So next question. Um, when you were doing your research that later became the book Tolkien and the Great War, what was the most surprising fact or facts you found about Tolkien's participation in the conflict? <sighs> I don't know because because the 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 
unfortunately, because Tolkien did not leave a personal record, and his record, army yeah. records say very little about what he did. I suppose it's simply the realisation of his large responsibility, which he underplayed um, during in, 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 in letters that he wrote. You know, he said, oh, I was so distracted by making up Elvish that I wasn't a very good officer, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, he was in charge of, of communications signals for his battalion of about 700 men. And that was an absolutely vital role. You know, we talk about the fog of war, this, this terrible confusion that surrounds what happens on the battlefield. Tolkien's job was to clear the fog. And his tools were very limited, you know, um, Morse code, which they couldn't use because the enemy could listen. Um, runners which were a problem because they could get shot. Semaphore flags, also you could get shot if you're standing there waving your flags. Pigeons, you know. Pigeons, um, <laughs> pigeons were, were actually surprisingly, you know, reliable. Um, but he, yeah, he, he was, for several months, the chief of communications, keeping his battalion informed of what was going on. Okay. That's quite interesting. So, um, as we know, uh, Tolkien was always involved in many literary groups like uh, TCBS, uh, Tea Club and Bavarian Society, to the Inklings. Uh, do you think these groups uh, were the push he needed to finish and publish his works? Yes, I do. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, really, I really do. Um, I think that if, if you look at Tolkien's productivity, um, in terms of actually wanting to bring something to publication, it only really succeeds when he was friends with C.S. Lewis in Oxford, um, who helped, and, he, and Tolkien said so, without his encouragement, I would not have finished The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, or raised The Lord of the Rings, especially to the level it was raised to. Um, and during the First World War, he first decided that he wanted to get his poetry, that's all he had written at the time, published. And he, and he was specifically encouraged to do so by his friends, the TCBS. TCBS. They read everything he wrote. Yeah. They critiqued it. They encouraged him both by positive and negative criticism. Um, and he, needed, he was a performer. This is one of the things I've realized about Tolkien. Um, he, he needed an audience and he wrote, he was, yes, he was very stubborn. He had very uh, definite ideas of his own, but he also liked to please his audience. I have a, a tremendous story, um, which I've, uh, ha has been published in, a, in a, uh, an English newspaper, but I'll tell it now in case you haven't heard it. Um, which was told to me by a man called Hugh Brogan, who had been a very, very um, keen fan of The Hobbit when he was a little boy. And he'd written fan mail to Tolkien. And Tolkien had responded and they'd started a correspondence. And one day Tolkien had to visit Cambridge, where young Hugh Brogan lived. And he said, I will come and visit you and your family. So he did. Um, and while he was there, he performed his party trick, right? And his party, his trick was to stand at the top of, they had a very wonderful staircase, and he stood at the top of the staircase and fell down it. <laughs> <laughs> Arm, this is what Hugh said to me, his arms and legs flying, and then got up, went at the bottom, got up uninjured you know so that's what i mean that is i think a, a perfect illustration of of what a keen performer tolkien was <laughs> yeah amazing uh john um you you wrote two um two epoch making books the worlds of J.R. talking lately and before that the talking uh, and the great war how did the research differ from one book to the other um 
Well, yeah. the research for Tolkien in the of, Great War of was... Of course, was, subject is different, but... But, but the, the, fir the first point, I suppose, is that Tolkien and the Great War was the big learning process. Ah. Um, and, and the major was not research, because I love, I love research. I could do it all the time if someone would pay me to. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the big, the, of, course, of course, it was a challenge, and I, and I worked really hard to make sure that I understood everything and that I... I answered all the questions that I felt needed answering that could be answered. Um, but the big challenge was turning that research into a, a piece of writing that people would want to read, that was clear, that addressed all the points that needed addressing, did so in the right order, uh, that was also powerful and moving. Um, with, uh, uh, th is. and that took five, that took five years, all in all. With the worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, it took eight months. Ah. Eight months. Um, um, and that was partly because I already was using research that I had done previously. Mm -hmm. There were bits, for example, that did not get into um, Tolkien and the Great War that I could use. Um, but it was partly because I, I was not as ambitious with this book um, as, as with Tolkien and the Great War. When I set out on it, I thought uh, I could just make a popular book that was simple to read with some pretty pictures because that's what the publisher wanted. <laughs> In fact, of course, when I got down to it, I realised that I don't write books like that. Um, I, I, I'm not interested in writing simple stuff that's been said before. I wanted it also to be, be a, a substantial and fascinating piece of research. So it took eight months. Um, I was quite organised. I suppose I practised with Tolkien in the Great War. Um, and then it took some more months where I was uh, helping the publisher design the pages and choose the pictures, which was a very big, important part of it. Indeed. It's a beautiful book. Thank mm. you. I think so too. <laughs> what, uh, what, it's, it's me, right? Yeah. Mia Weiss? Yeah? Yes, it's your turn, yeah. I guess. Okay. What was the biggest, biggest misconception you found about a place that supposedly influenced Tolkien? Um, well, there are several. Um, <laughs> I suppose the... The, the, there's one that I, I attack in, in, in an appendix to the book, which is the idea that Tolkien was deeply influenced by an archaeological excavation at a place called Lydney Park in England. Um, and this is all based on the, uh, the fact that he wrote a note for the report, the published report about that excavation. The note is simply an account of uh, the name of a British god, Nodens, that was found on uh, inscriptions at that archaeological site. But it turns out uh, that Tolkien was really just summarising scholarship that had already been made. He adds a very small point of his own at the end, and that he... There's no evidence that he visited the site or that he personally knew the archaeologist R.E.M. Wheeler. Um, I, I think it's very, very unlikely that this place had the impact on him that people seem to think it had. Um, and another one is the idea that the two towers, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the title of the, the middle volume of The Lord of the Rings, was inspired by two towers near where he lived in Birmingham. Um, mm -hmm. And I've I've given a, 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 I gave a talk on that point um, last year at the Tolkien Society's Birmingham uh, convention, uh, in which I, I pointed out that no no one in Birmingham seems to have called those towers the two towers until 1992 mm -hmm. or, or later, when the Tolkien Society itself jokingly connected them with Tolkien's title. Ah. That joke has taken on a life of its own <laughs> and now become 
fact, you know, uh, mm. but it's not fact. Talking about okay. places, uh, aren't there some pubs in Oxford that uh, the owners say that, uh, say that, oh, here Tolkien wrote uh, Lord of the Rings? I think there are. Aren't, aren't. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's, <laughs> yeah. a pub, there's a pub in Lancashire in the north of England where they say he wrote the whole of the book um, and and this is obviously absurd. I think there's another pub in Wales where he wrote the book. Yeah, maybe not um, in Oxford, but I think I've read about it. <laughs> the pu publicans uh, always seem very keen to get Tolkien attached to yeah. their pubs. Um, but no, of course, there, there, there are pubs in Oxford that were very important to him, yeah, especially sure. the Eagle and Child, where the Inklings would meet yes. and they, they did not read their works to each other, but that was something that they did do elsewhere. Um, and there are pubs in Oxford where I think I, very likely um, that the, uh, the Green Dragon is a reference to, there was a pub called the Green Dragon uh, when Tolkien was an undergraduate in, in Oxford. Um, and the Prancing Pony in The Lord of the Rings was originally called the White Horse. And the, the Inklings also used to meet in a pub um, in the middle of Oxford called the White Horse, uh, where, where incidentally I have worked as a barman. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> nice. It's, Mr. Butterbur, I presume. Right, yes. <laughs> it's uh, really close to Waters, uh, Waterstones? No, Blackwells. Blackwells, Blackwells Library. Yes, it's, right? it's basically underneath Blackwells, yeah. Yes. He knows it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, next question. Uh, it is believed that the movie Tolkien that was released uh, last year in 2019 uh, used Tolkien and the Great War uh, as one of its main sources. Uh, what are your views on the movie? And also, my my edition is the one that says Tolkien. Now a major, uh, now motion, a major picture. motion picture. Yeah. It's, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That that was that was my publisher's decision, um, and I did not argue with it because, of course, so. I I yeah. want people to buy my book. But there's very little connection between my book and the film. Yes, I understand that it was used as a source, um, but the. <sighs> The uh, the film, uh, the director and the screenwriter, or screenwriters, there were two, um, yeah. uh, were very, very free with how they used the facts. So they, they changed the chronology of major events, they changed people's personalities, yes. um, they, they changed some very, really sort of fundamental things about why things happened and how things happened. Um, so it, it it's a, bears very little relationship to my book, except I suppose from them both and squint, you, that you can see something <laughs> similar. Uh, and, and that would be that the, the, they both the book and the film say that the, the First World War had a profound effect on, on Tolkien's creativity. Um, so in that sense, the film is correct. It's just the, 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 the means by which that happened, uh, I think, is, is not accurate. So both rings are round in that sense. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, just to give a single example, um, in the movie... Tolkien comes out of the Battle of the Somme and he is unable to write. For years and years, he, he, he has a kind of traumatized writer's block. And that's, yes. a, that's a classic story of many First World War writers. They couldn't write until maybe a decade later. Not he. But of course, in Tolkien's case, actually, he started writing the Book of Lost Tales as soon as he came out of the trenches. And the only reason he stopped it seems, is because he got too busy with his career after the war. Yeah. Uh, questions, questions. Um, <laughs> interviews make you late for dinner, you know. Uh, we <laughs> hope sorry. we're not making you late for dinner. <laughs> um, what we want to know, John, is if you, can, if you can talk about that, what are your current projects and your future projects? Um, I, the, there's a book that I have been calling Tolkien's Mirror that I started writing in 2015 when I was a fellow at the Black Mountain Institute in Las Vegas. 
And that is about Tolkien's work as a reflection of the crises of his times. So it revisits the First World War and how that influenced him, um, adding a great deal that I've learned uh, since writing Tolkien in the Great War, a great deal that I've, a, a great many thoughts that I've had. Um, but it, it, then it goes beyond the First World War to talk about, um, notably, the Spanish Civil War <laughs> and the the collapse of the the post First World War peace in 1936, which seems to have been a big influence on the invention of Numenor. You know, a, a land of promise that is squandered by its inhabitants. Um, and then it, it moves on to the impact of the Second World War, which is, of course, another thing that Tolkien said had nothing to do with his writing with The Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah. I believe that it can be shown that it did, it, but it's really, what it did is really interesting. I've got some real revelations, I think. And do, do you think Tolkien would be satisfied with the world we have today? Ah, no, no of course not. <laughs> no, no, um, no. You, you have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, people get increasingly um, bad-tempered and curmudgeonly the older they get. And now he would have been uh, older than the old Took. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so you know, the, the, quite, I'm being quite serious about this. I, I, I think it's impossible, of course, to say uh, what would Tolkien have thought if he had been alive today? Because if he'd been alive, alive today, he would not have been the Tolkien we know. Yeah. He was a product of his times, even yes, if he was a are. great individual. Um, but also during his own lifetime, and this happens to many, many people, they lose their ability to feel that they are a part of their own times. So in old age, people feel that they are exiles from their, old, their own mm. times. And I think Tolkien felt Good that. old times. Uh, um, go on, Tim. Excuse me, Ronald. Just, yeah, uh, uh, we have a little time. Um, Besides Talk and Talk, I have another channel. It's called, uh, how can I say in English? It's The Catholic Guardian. It's Catholic about Guardian. Tolkien and the Catholic Church. I try okay. to see things through this, uh, um, this glass. Né? So how do, do you think, uh, how important was the church to Tolkien's writing? I think it can be... Writing. Uh, I think that's a really difficult question, um, and, and I think Tolkien answered it quite well. You know, he, he said that it was a fundamentally Catholic work, The Lord of the Rings. He did. Um, but he said that it wasn't explicitly so and could not be explicitly so. Something more symbolic, uh, the message. I, 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 think, I think it flows through the, the, the whole idea of... Um, a, a world in which there is a, 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 a spirit imbued in the world itself, um, which you can access if you are uh, if if you are sensitive to it. That gives the world value. Uh, of course, it's it's much more explicit in the Silmarillion and the Book of Lost Tales with the creation myth. Um, but it, I think it, I think the Catholicism can be found um, in in other places too, and and even today I've been preparing um, a, a lecture today for uh, Signum University, where I looked again at what happened in 1914 to the Catholic University at Louvain in Belgium, Leuven I think it's now called, which was destroyed by German troops early in the First World War. The, Ger the war had just started. The Germans decided to attack Invaded. France through Belgium. So Belgium was a neutral country and all of a sudden there were German troops moving through it and there were atrocities. Um, and one of those atrocities was the destruction of this Catholic university that had a great library with medieval manuscripts and, and so on. Um, 
And this was a horror, a shock to the civilized world. It was destroyed by fire. They, they shut the doors, smashed the windows, threw uh, fuel inside and incendiary bombs and burned the whole place down uh, very callously. Um, and I have a f oh, and, and another fact about this is that uh, Tolkien's guardian, Father Francis Morgan, had studied at the University of Louvain in the 1870s. So I have a feeling that that incident would have had a very deep impression on Tolkien and that that might be why he has Gondolin destroyed by fire, right? So the fall of Gondolin is in many ways a direct response, I think, to Tolkien's experiences in the Battle of the Somme because it has those tremendous uh, mechanical style dragons that are yeah. so reminiscent yeah. of First World War tanks. Indeed. Right? Um, but I think the fire element may well go back to the, the shock, the impact of, of that uh, by the Germans on the University of Louvain. That's an interesting connection. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we are nearing the end of your interview, very regrettably. Um, uh, Sergio wanted me to make an important announcement. Uh, it's important to me and I think important mm -hmm. to you also. Um, your book, John Garth's book, Talking in the Great War, is now in the process of being translated by myself. Ooh. I have reached the middle of the book, more or less. <laughs> And it will be published in Portuguese by HarperCollins Brazil as soon as this is feasible. And we think in early 2022, uh, the book will be out. That's fantastic nice. news. And I will be very honored to have my name together with your name on the cover page. <laughs> Excellent. I will be honored to have your name along with mine. I have my work. <laughs> Thank and we you, look John. forward to it. And we, uh, we look forward to your new book that you're yeah, writing. Sure. Uh, we hope it will come out soon. Yeah. Uh, so I have to end the interview. It was so, so, so nice. We learned a lot from you. Uh, you can consider us your talking friends. If you need anything here in Brazil from anything, you can ask us. You have my number, mm -hmm. my email. You can contact me, contact Ronas or Inês. Inês you, have my axe, you have my sword. <laughs> yes. uh, Inês, Inês is our contact in Portugal if you need anything there too so um, uh, we are open to anything you want to yeah. tell Brazilians it was a great evening here and I, I will let Inês and Ronald uh, say goodbye to you and thank you very much thank you okay. do you want me to go first or ladies <laughs> ladies Okay. Ladies first. Thank you. So I want to thank you once again for being here with my friends uh, Sergio and Ronald and it was a pleasure to be with you all and to meet you John Garth and I hope we, we met, meet again one day, another interview, who knows, in England maybe, <laughs> I wish, who knows, right? So uh, I, know, I don't know, I'm shaking, I'm so nervous. <laughs> but I, I want she was to so nervous before we started. Yeah. I didn't even know to say like hello in English. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm joking, right? <laughs> I, I would like to I'm say sorry like... for uh, just uh, 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 yeah, because she said that. I'm sorry for the English mistakes, but, uh, not Ronald. Yeah. Ronald is always right, but me and Inez, uh, so oh, we, we don't usually speak in English uh, with yeah, our voices. So your your English is right. far better than my Portuguese. Yeah, when, I, when I'm nervous, no I don't even know how to speak Portuguese, so English is more. So I, I'm so happy to be here with you. It's such a pleasure. Uh, a pleasure. I'm so young and you are... <laughs> So old. We have so much. No, no. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> no, you have so so much to te to teach Experience. me. Experience. And I, yeah. And I hope one day I will know the elf, the elf of everything you know. Like. Well, thank you. Be... Okay, so that's well, it. <laughs> John, it was a real pleasure uh, meeting you. Next best thing to meeting you in person. 
Uh, it was wonderful talking to you, hearing all you have to say, and I, I was very honored uh, of being part of this group that interviewed you. Thank you for all your words and thank you for all your good humor and your readiness to, to tell us a bit of, of, the, of the many things of what you have researched and of what you know. Thank you very much. My pleasure. It was, thank you. It's been great. It was a, a wonderful right. lecture for us. Yes. So we'll, we will end this interview now. Uh, I hope you go, guys enjoyed uh, the, and, I, and as uh, Sergio said before at the beginning of the interview, we hope this is the first of many international interviews with famous Tolkienists and, <laughs> and maybe other people. So guys, don't forget to subscribe our channel, leave a comment down, down, down below, and to the non-Portuguese speakers, we have two playlists on our channel, one with English subtitles and one with Spanish subtitles. Uh, I will leave them uh, link, down, link down below. So if you're not Portuguese, Brazilian, if you don't understand Portuguese at all, you can watch these videos. There are a few compared with all the videos we have in our channel, but, but it's something <laughs> and we are working on it. So I think I've said everything. Don't forget to support her, to support us in the other social media. For our uh, Brazilian fans, they know they can help us through Amazon.com.br using our links. You can sponsor us, you know, everything, those things. So I say goodbye to all of you. It was a pleasure, as I said before. And I, uh, as I always say in Portuguese, um grande beijinho. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye and thank you all. It was a pleasure. Imagina o Ronald a traduzir isso tudo depois em português. Já. Realmente ia ficar muito... Imagina que ele dava uma resposta de 3 minutos. Como é que nos íamos é. lembrar de tudo o que ele disse? Ia, ia ter que ser bastante resumido, não é? E, é. e iriam-se perder, iriam perder coisas pelo caminho. Também é como sai em janeiro. O Filipe e o Gustavo que... Aumento de serviço e trabalho, não é? <risos> Já está gravando, viu, Ronald? Tá gravando? Ótimo. Já. Então, vou controlar minha linguagem. <risos> okay. Não, mas aqui vai ser cortado na edição. <risos> Mais uma vez, o seu cenário tá porreta, Sérgio. É. Tá fantástico. <risos> eu perguntei se ele tinha gostado. Ele disse, o que é que eu disse? Ele disse, eu gostei, mas eu não sei como é que faz esse tipo de coisa. <risos> <coughs> Dá uma tossidinha aqui. <risos> o trabalho do Ronald melhorou agora, né? Que não vai ter que traduzir instantaneamente. <risos> Dureza, viu? Já, já fiz isso em empresa e a coisa é complicada. Aí o cara está falando sobre pigmentos e corantes e as suas aplicações na indústria têxtil, na indústria de couro. Uh, foi complicado. A única, uh, e o cara falava em alemão ainda por cima. Ainda bem que o alemão era a minha língua de todo dia, porque eu trabalhava numa empresa alemã, mas complicado. Ilumina iluminação tá boa, né? Ok? Ah, cabelo, tá. barba, dá uma a paradinha aqui. Penteado, tá penteado. O meu cabelo está esticado aqui atrás, mas, à frente, mas aqui atrás não mexi. <risos> Também é só o que se vê <risos> Minha camisa está passada na frente, atrás não está. <risos> a minha não está passada de tudo. Mas... Bem, acho, espero muito que esta seja realmente a primeira de muitas, né? E... Ok, kids. Thanks. Ah, mas depois, quando tivermos os quatro em tela. <risos> Você não mandou para Sir Christopher Lee. É, porque ainda não consegui essa conexão astral. <risos> I am Dracula. Bom que tá gravando, aí depois a gente coloca nos melhores momentos. Da... <risos> no, os bloopers. Bloopers. É. <risos> John, oh uh, thank you very thank much you. for your time. Thank I know you. you are traveling and you're so busy, but you had the time to talk to yeah. us. Thank you very It's much. Very as Yes, it's, yeah, it's, I... it's, impo it's important to me too, honestly, uh, you know, especially at the moment uh, when you can't go out and give talks to people. It, 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 as a writer, a nice you, you're, you're even more isolated than normal. So, yeah, yeah. indeed. So okay. thank you very much. Again. All right. Okay. See you Signing again, sometime, I hope. Thank yeah. you. Bye okay. bye. Goodbye. Bye. bye.